Hello everyone, welcome back. So, we are going to continue from the previous session. Uh, in the previous session, again this is the outline before you, we, we looked at the units and the terms, then the uh, conventional energy resources uh, that, that we use today and then the depletion and the risks that are associated with that. Uh, the, now, now we are going to change gears and we are going into uh, looking at environmentally benign, benign means uh, not harmful. So, the environmentally friendly uh, forms of energy so to speak uh, and, and then we look at uh, some of the efficiency measures that we need to take in our uh, existing uh, uh, ways of uh, using energy. And then uh, towards the end I have a list of some things uh, that uh, people in different fields uh, can uh, do in order to um, uh, help alleviate this issue. Uh, and uh, there are like what chemical engineers can do, what materials engineers can do uh, and so on and so forth as well as uh, what a regular consumer can do. So, uh, now let us continue uh, with the uh, environmentally benign forms of energy. Somebody had uh, asked about uh, solar energy and I am definitely going to talk about that. So, if you look at the alternative energy forms, uh, the environmentally friendly forms, uh, there is good news. The, the continuous or renewable energy sources, they are, uh, they far exceed uh, human needs at present. At present, whatever is the human energy consumption compared to that, uh, there is far more available. So, and, and in general, we also have technology to harness it, in general, but there are some gaps. So, that is where there is tremendous scope for R&D as well as uh, commercialization efforts. So, there is, there are huge potential markets in this area. Uh, let us start off by looking at the global energy flows, uh, mainly uh, everything is uh, driven by solar energy, the entire biosphere on the earth is powered by solar energy. Uh, so, you have large quantities of solar energy coming in into the atmosphere, some of it is intercepted by the atmosphere, uh, part of it is reflected, uh, some of it is absorbed by the atmosphere, some of it reaches down uh, uh, and is absorbed by the earth. Uh, part of it gets reflected from the earth's surface. Uh, so, uh, the, the fraction that gets reflected from the earth's surface as observed from uh, space is called as uh, the earth's albedo, A L B E D O. That is the whiteness or the reflectivity of the earth. Some of the light as I said gets reflected, then the part uh, that gets absorbed by the earth's surface leads to heating of the earth. So, when any black body you must have studied in physics when any object gets heated up, uh, it will start emitting some radiation uh, depending on its temperature. So, it gets heated up and it starts radiating energy and uh, so there is some radiation that goes out uh, from the earth and part of that radiation because the earth's temperature is uh, average temperature of the globe is very low, the emission is in the infrared. So, uh, that, that long wave infrared radiation part of it is absorbed by the earth's atmosphere. Uh, due to gas molecules which we know as uh, greenhouse gases. So, uh, the, the most dominant among them is water vapor followed by carbon dioxide. This is kind of uh, surprising and shocking to many people. Uh, carbon dioxide is not the, not the most important uh, greenhouse gas. It is water vapor which is the most important greenhouse gas, but water vapor, the level of water vapor is, is regulated by the water cycle and the, uh, the temperature. So, we the anthropogenic contribution is not in terms of increasing water vapor, uh, the anthropogenic contribution to global warming is due to increasing of the other greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide and methane. So, anyway, so this greenhouse gas molecules they absorb the, uh, the emission part of the emission of the earth and as the, the, the infrared radiation couples to the molecular vibrations of uh, the, uh, the those gases and they as they vibrate they, they re-emit uh, the, the same frequency. Part of it goes into outer space, but part of it is shot back to the earth which leads to a, a slight uh, uh, additional heating of the earth and that is what is global warming. What I, well, the reason I am showing you this is because this uh, will help you understand the global warming problem, it will help you connect many things uh, and it will also help you to understand that the entire biosphere is actually powered by the sun. So, it is the energy from the sun that uh, is uh, the basis of the entire biosphere. 
even wind energy for that matter is solar energy indirectly because it is uh, solar radiation that heats up uh, the atmosphere leads to th the thermal uh, currents uh, which is what is wind. And of course, there is contribution from the rotation of the earth also, but okay, the, the main driver is um, solar energy. Okay. So, if we look at the uh, global energy potential of various uh, forms, we see that solar energy is huge. This is the world energy consumption. Okay. See how small it is and see how large this is. And then we have the fossil fuels, you have coal, coal is also pretty large and the amount of coal that is present uh, is, is quite large. Uh, this is the, uh, the, um, the annual consumption. Okay. And then you have uranium, uh, you have oil, natural gas. So, all these fossil fuels are, are basically solar energy that was converted into chemical energy many, many years ago. So, this also is indirectly solar energy, but except that it happens over a much larger uh, time frame. And again you have wind over here, biomass, hydro and so the potentials of these are, are relatively small, but solar energy is plentiful. So, another, another graphic which kind of uh, emphasizes how, how plentiful solar energy is. Um, so, over here what you can see uh, the, the, the various um, uh, colors that you can see uh, are indicative of how much solar energy falls on that region. So, the redder it is the more solar energy you have and the bluer it is or green or blue you, you have less and less solar energy. So, um, on this world map you see these black spots on each of the continents. Those black spots are uh, something like uh, 100 kilometers or something, okay, whatever, whatever they are in dimension. Um, it is if, if those areas are covered with solar panels operating at a very uh, low efficiency of 8 percent commercial uh, uh, photovoltaics um, panels systems operate upwards from 14 percent polycrystalline silicon. But let us assume that the solar panels we have over here are um, operating at a very low efficiency of 8 percent, then these black spots will capture enough energy to serve the world's energy needs. Now, this data again may be a little out of date, uh, but uh, it again uh, it communicates the message that there is plenty of solar energy. Now, this is only uh, uh, this uh, diagram only indicates how much solar energy is available. It does not specifically address the, the issues that exist with solar energy and we are going to uh, talk about those uh, issues right away. Uh, just for curiosity sake, uh, I have, I have um, shown this solar spectrum, uh, the light that comes from the sun, it comes in various wavelengths or um, packets of energy and the orange curve uh, over here is the solar spectrum as it is outside of our atmosphere. As it enters the atmosphere, some of it gets absorbed, some of it gets reflected. Uh, and so on and so forth. So, you see the uh, what is known as the extraterrestrial spectrum, which is the spectrum seen outside of the earth's atmosphere is uh, this, whereas the inner uh, curve corresponds to the terrestrial spectrum, maybe at sea level. So, you see that there is some drop in, in the flux that reaches here that is due to the absorption process and you see that at certain wavelengths there is uh, almost total absorption. So, this is due to the various greenhouse gas molecules. So, you have um, over here you have absorption due to oxygen, ozone, the photochemical reactions that lead to the formation and degradation of ozone in the atmosphere. On this side you have absorption by water vapor, carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gases. Okay, so, solar energy is actually wonderful and versatile. There are two distinct types of applications of solar energy. One is uh, the, the heating kind of applications, heating cooling kind of applications and uh, then the second is uh, electricity generation. Uh, electricity generation can be made through heat. So, by heating you can generate steam and through the steam you can uh, run turbines to generate electricity. So, that is one way and the uh, other way is uh, photovoltaics. 
So uh, all these technologies have been implemented and there are practical examples of each of them. Uh, and, and I'm going to show you some very interesting, I, I think we are familiar with some of the usual um, examples, but I, I'll give you some uh, which are not so, so common, which uh, many of you might not have seen or even thought of. So they were surprising to me, so I assume that uh, many, many people would enjoy uh, watching those. Okay. If we just take a look at PV, so what is PV? PV means photovoltaics. Photovoltaics means um, harnessing of solar energy. They usually have a semiconductor material and uh, it, it directly gives you uh, electric current. So it is, um, it is the solar cell technology. Solar cells are photovoltaic. There is the, the other one which I uh, mentioned is called as solar thermal where you heat up a, a fluid and you rotate turbines uh, in a thermodynamic cycle uh, and uh, then you generate electricity. So that is the other kind. So if you look at just the, the PV market, you see that it is uh, rising very steeply from year 2000 to uh, 2013. You see how steeply it is rising and in various parts of the world. Uh, this technology is very promising and it has, it is going to go a long way. Now I think it has hit the imagination of the common man and I think there's, there's only growth that I can see uh, further. So, um, okay. So this uh, technology may look good, but there are there are definitely some issues. One of the major issues is intermittence. Um, what do you understand by intermittence? Intermission. We are all familiar with the word intermission in a movie. So intermission is a break. So solar energy is not available continuously. It is available in breaks. Now uh, the, the the good thing is that solar energy can be very uh, uh, the solar radiation uh, can be very easily predicted. Uh, in fact, in another course that I teach, uh, um, all the students actually make uh, very good calculations of what the uh, direct uh, solar uh, intensity is going to be at so and so time of the year and so and so time of the day. Uh, so it, those calculations are very easy, but the only unpredictable thing that uh, uh, comes is due to cloud cover. So. Uh, Cloud cover uh, can bring in a lot of uh, unpredictability because the weather models are not that sophisticated that it is going to exactly predict uh, when in a, in a particular region uh, there is going to be cloud cover and when it is not. Maybe the, um, general predictions are, are more accurate as compared to like uh, very specific predictions. Uh, there was another point over here is that in many places large amounts of energy is required during the daytime, particularly in industrial regions, uh, large amounts of energy are required during daytime. So solar energy is also available during the daytime. So in uh, this changes from city to city or, or place to place, but in, in certain places when uh, the demand is high during the day, under such circumstances solar energy can become a very good um, form of energy because it is also available during the day. Otherwise you have a storage problem. So in places where the evening, uh, evening time normally lights and uh, in, in uh, urban places everybody turns on the lights and uh, all your televisions and gadgets and things like that. So at, at that time uh, there is uh, no sunlight. So um, there, then there is a mismatch. So how to meet that demand becomes a problem and that can only be met with uh, the known conventional energy forms. Nevertheless, uh, as long as the sun shines, if it is connected to the, if the solar installations are connected to the grid, then they can at least take part of the burden so that some conventional fuels can be saved. So connecting to the grid, connecting renewable energy forms or these continuous uh, energy forms to the grid is a great idea and it should be done, but there are some practical problems. The grid infrastructure that we have today and in many uh, places it is not very reliable. So it cannot take on too many of these uh, renewables because of their intermittence. They are not really very predictable. So uh, it becomes a, it is a real nightmare to um, ensure that uh, the demand is met through unpredictable sources. So uh, a significant amount of uh, uh, conventional energy forms need to be still connected to the grid uh, until, until we develop some alternatives and which I will, I will also discuss. So uh, how does the grid connected system work? Uh, Let us let's say that you have, a, you have solar panels on your rooftop and uh, the, 
the electricity company or the electricity grid, they allow what is known as net metering or bidirectional metering. So, there is a meter which will run both ways, it can run forward or it can run backward or there may be two meters and one, one measures how much energy you are taking from the grid and the other measures how much energy you are supplying to the grid. So, each consumer can be a potential supplier. Now, the green curve or the green area is the energy that you require. So, this starts at 12 midnight and goes to 12 midnight the next day. So, this is the time axis and over here is the kilowatts of power used. So, at midnight obviously your use is very less and then in the morning it kind of builds up and it peaks sometime around evening uh, in your home when you turn on all the lights and everything and then towards night it goes on decreasing. So, this is the, the, uh, the load curve and if you have solar panels on your roof then it they would be generating in, a, in this certain time span whenever the sun rises the production would gradually increase and uh, be maximum around midday and then go on dec decreasing. So, while you are connected to the grid you are supplying to the grid. So, the, the energy bill that comes to you would not be equivalent to the entire green area, but it is it is the green curve minus the grey curve. So, you would be paying only for that much. And if you if you oversize your panels, in other words, you have instead of putting a one kilowatt panel, if you put a three four kilowatt panel, then this curve would be this big, and you would uh, even end up getting a check at the end of the month instead of a bill. So it that is that is the whole concept. So in concept, it is a great idea, uh, except you can see the problem uh, right away that you need to depend on the grid, the solar. Uh, installation is not going to give you uh, power all 24 hours. There is uh, another issue with uh, solar, cells are quite expensive, but there has been a steady decline and I am afraid I do not have uh, data on that, but the, the cost of solar cells is reducing very rapidly. Uh, I think uh, it due in part to China, but the costs have uh, de uh, decreased very significantly and they are now very cheap. And uh, there are other technologies of uh, solar cells apart from the polycrystalline silicon or the single crystal silicon, uh, which are which are even cheaper. For example, disensitized solar cells. These are very cheap. Uh, they are uh, they also appear. They have even been applied on flexible substrates. So you can essentially have a flexible sub substrate which which can work as a solar cell. Uh, so cost is coming down, and I think it's only a matter of time before it becomes uh, very very affordable. There is, uh, while many developments are happening in various parts and in various areas, one interesting development is building integrated photovoltaics. So, uh, the, the concept is something like this, uh, you have to pay for building material, you, you need a roof over your head and the roof is made out of some material and it has some cost. So, um, if the solar cell can work as a roof tile even if the solar roof tile is a little little bit more expensive than the regular roof tile you are you are not duplicating things so in that sense there is some cost saving also if they if these panels are integrated then uh, yeah, they they look very nice uh, it looks very beautiful they, these uh, entire facades uh, that you see over here uh, so uh, this is another concept that is coming uh, particularly in uh, in these green buildings Another thing, uh, uh, if your, uh, your roof in general, it is, uh, it is exposed to the sun whether you like it or not and it is gaining heat. So, the, the building, your house becomes so unbearably hot in summer uh, because the, the walls and the, the roof is exposed to sunlight and that, that sunlight uh, whatever of it gets absorbed is only heating the home and that heat you have to somehow you drive out in order for the home to be uh, livable, therefore you have to install an air conditioner. But if part of it is absorbed by, uh, is converted to solar energy, then you have some, some little bit of uh, respite from the heat. So, you can reduce building heat gain uh, by, uh, by putting such 
structure. So it could include solar water heaters or it could be uh, uh, solar uh, uh, PV panels. Okay. Uh, I am going to now show you uh, another concept. Um, uh, there is a, uh, I, maybe non-engineers are not uh, familiar with this. There is something called as cogeneration. So um, cogeneration is uh, generation of electricity as well as heat. Uh, if you remember from uh, maybe uh, uh, high school or first year of engineering, uh, you have uh, these your, your steam ranking cycle or your power plants normally operate at relatively low efficiencies which are, uh, they are low because of some laws in thermodynamics. They, you, we must have uh, studied the Carnot cycle efficiency which depends on the two temperatures. So there is, there are, there is a thermodynamic limit to how much, uh, how efficient uh, a heat engine can get and that cannot be easily violated. Uh, as a result, if you have any, uh, for even if it is a fossil fuel based uh, generation, the entire heat of the fuel never gets converted into electricity, only part of it gets, uh, gets converted. So uh, let, us, let us assume that if, if uh, no special um, uh, design is made, uh, let us assume that that efficiency is roughly 30 percent. So only 30 percent of the fuel's energy uh, is converted to electricity, whereas 70 percent gets wasted. So the waste heat goes through the, the chimney and uh, really that, that, is, that is not of any benefit to anyone. Now uh, cogeneration will actually capture that heat and use it for some other purpose. So if you take the electrical generation as well as the heat output, if you club the two, then overall you will be utilizing uh, a greater fraction of the, uh, uh, of the fuel's energy without violating second law of thermodynamics. So that is, that is the whole idea uh, of cogeneration. Now that cogeneration can be further extended into multi-generation. So multi-generation means you are not only generating electricity and heat, electricity plus heat generation of two, uh, two forms of energy is called as cogeneration, but you can even generate cooling. Now how do you generate cooling out of uh, heat? Uh, it, it, is a, it is a very old technology, uh, people, uh, at least some people probably have heard of absorption chillers. Uh, they, they, I think that the technology must be more than 100 years old. Uh, th that is how they used to make ice before our uh, vapor compression cycles. So um, the, the absorption chiller uh, works on, it takes heat from at one end and it provides cooling at the other end. So there is a thermodynamic cycle that enables that to happen. Co-generation or multi-generation is some, some, something that can be applied to even fossil fuels and it should be applied. It, there are many places where it has already been done. Uh, towards the end, I have a couple of slides on that. This video is about solar co-generation. So you have solar thermal energy and that so, th thermal energy is going to be converted partly into uh, electricity and partly into heat. There are two approaches to do that. One is, uh, one is you can have high temperature photovoltaics, so you concentrate uh, using a, a reflector, you concentrate uh, solar light on a, on a very small sized uh, solar cell which operates at a very high temperature. And on the back side of that uh, solar cell, you have a heat exchanger, so it heats up uh, a fluid and that heat can be used for some other purpose and the small solar, uh, solar cell is generating electricity. So this is one approach. The other approach is you simply make steam uh, and uh, you, um, you operate uh, maybe a steam Rankine cycle or you, uh, maybe an organic Rankine cycle. And um, then you have, uh, the, for the waste heat, uh, you have another, an another way to uh, take care of that through a heat exchanger or a bottoming cycle, whichever. So uh, there are couple of ways in which it is done and uh, there are, in fact, I am uh, I'm pleasantly surprised that there are even companies which have, uh, which are started based on these ideas. Okay. Uh, there is another issue uh, related to solar energy and that is uh, that it is very diffuse. Uh, diffuseness means uh, low energy density. So per unit area, uh, there, is, there is little solar energy available. Uh, it is not like you can have a, uh, a small size solar panel and it is going to power your entire home. If you want to power your entire home, you would need a very large size of solar panel. So uh, how, do you, how do you address this diffuse, uh, diffuseness problem? You can concentrate the solar energy 
and uh, then it can you can uh, in a, in a small area you get greater energy uh, density so uh, that, that is one of the ways and these parabolic reflectors or there are lenses fresnel lenses can can focus uh, the, the light on a relatively small area this is this has been used uh, for even industrial steam production so in the multi generation that i said you can make steam for industrial processes also uh, not only supply heat for domestic purposes um, some of the very large uh, solar thermal plants look somewhat like this so what you have over here uh, is a is a whole huge farm of the solar reflectors which are all they are they have microcontrollers and they are tracking the sun so as the sun moves through the sky these panels also follow it so they are tracking the sun and they are reflecting the light all to this central tower so this is called a heliostat the, uh, these reflectors are are all focusing their light onto the central tower and that tower gets extremely hot this this point uh, gets extremely hot and then there is a uh, there is a heat exchange fluid sometimes it's a, a molten metal or me molten salt or something like that which is the fluid and that carries the heat to these stored tanks over here which contain that molten salt so you have a lot of energy that is stored in the form of heat in the molten salt now this is a this is something really beautiful which is not available with uh, photovoltaics is that uh, th there is stored energy so you have energy that is stored at a very high temperature being at a high temperature you can efficiently use it uh, you can efficiently convert it into electricity the higher the temperature the more the efficiency in conversion so it is high grade heat that you are storing over here and you can essentially run this plant uh, 24 hours so even when the sun goes down you still have accumulated adequate amount of uh, heat to run it for the night until the sun comes back up in the morning but uh, or this such a such a system would would work better if it is uh, in a in a dry dry region like a desert or somewhere where it doesn't get too cloudy because if you have several cloudy days or in 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 a in a line then you would have problems i am going to show an animation about that uh, stored uh, so solar uh, solar thermal also now similarly uh, just as you have solar energy which is uh, which is uh, at least in the the pv market is rising very fast similarly generation of electricity from wind also has been rising very steeply and um, uh, the the prices are also very good now, there are many issues related to to wind energy the uh, its um, uh, integration with the grid its unpredictability and the, the even even the government electricity boards not being able to uh, to pay up to the wind producers so there are there are many issues uh, but i think uh, we need to systematically solve all those issues now uh, yes uh, there is geothermal energy there is tidal energy but uh, i i showed you that that resource map uh, the res availability of resources it is relatively small and again it is localized in some places um wave energy is is not a mainstream yet uh, solar and uh, wind are are really uh, in many places they have achieved uh, grid parity meaning the the cost is uh, cost is comparable to the grid prices uh, in many places under many conditions so uh, that, that is why i'm paying a little more attention to them as uh, if the other technologies uh, mature up then we would be discussing that also uh wave energy again the, 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 there are there are issues that that diffuseness is is a is a common issue with all of them so if we uh, just have to summarize what are the main barriers for uh, these renewable and continuous energy forms then they would be intermittence it is a, an issue that is common with wind solar wave tidal not with geothermal geothermal does not have that problem Uh, there is another issue of unpredictability or poor predictability so with solar energy there is good predictability except for weather weather conditions so if uh, there is cloud cover then that is a problem otherwise solar energy is highly predictable uh, with wind energy again the predictability for uh, integrating on a large scale with the grid they they would ideally want to have an hourly prediction uh, for for those regions and 
um, in many places at least in India that data is not uh, available or it is not so, so reliable. This diffuseness or low energy density is a problem, uh, but there are ways of overcoming that and in spite of the, the diffuseness and all that, the efficiencies that we are getting are, are, uh, are pretty good. Now, uh, just to put things in perspective, um, we know that the biosphere is, is so diverse, uh, although, uh, although we have not had this session on uh, biodiversity, but it is really awesome and so exciting to see even these programs uh, that come up on uh, National Geographic. So much of biodiversity and so much of beauty around. Um, nature manages to do all that through photosynthesis. What is the, what is the engine that, that drives this entire biosphere? It is uh, solar, conversion of solar energy through photosynthesis. And photosynthesis efficiencies are very low. So with just a couple of percent of efficiency, um, nature has been able to do these wonders and it's, it's truly a miracle. If you really sometimes, uh, we, we just see a tree or a plant and we think it is just a tree or just a plant, uh, but uh, we don't see the miracle that it actually is. It is really amazing. If you, if you actually try to study it, it is so, so amazing. So if uh, nature is able to do such great miracles with uh, photosynthetic conversion efficiencies of hardly a couple of percent and if you, uh, you know, basically uh, distribute it over the 24 hour cycle, then it would be less than 1 percent. So, with such poor efficiencies, nature is able to do all this and it is also able to store solar energy in the form of chemical energy. So, it has actually achieved breakthroughs and uh, we are uh, living examples of those breakthroughs. Plants and animals and we too, uh, we are products of that biosphere which again indirectly everything is dr uh, driven or powered by the, uh, by solar energy. So, if uh, we have in fact done better, we have done much better our solar cell efficiencies are very high. Uh, so, uh, really speaking, there should not be a problem. We just need to develop technology uh, that is adequate for our purpose. So, uh, what I am trying to say is the present setbacks are not show stoppers. There are, there, are, there are bound to be ways we can learn from nature, we can learn from uh, our experience and we can bank on innovation. Now, um, the intermittence and poor predictability means that if, if we have to large penetration of uh, these continuous or renewable energy forms into our energy mix, by a large penetration I mean they should have large, larger shares uh, in, the, in the energy mix, then we must integrate it with some storage and there is no easy way of storing electricity on a very large scale. The batteries and all that are might be okay for your home, but even for your home they are pretty expensive. So, uh, they are definitely not practical at a, uh, at a utility scale. The utility is the, is the grid of, of the city or the state or whatever. Um, there are more barriers. So, what we are looking at is we are looking at barriers for these alternative energy forms and they are intermittence, the predictability, diffuseness, lack of available and efficient storage. Then there are commercial and governmental factors. Uh, government subsidies uh, and support for conventional energy forms is very high, whereas for the, the alternate energy is not comparable. Uh, there is a, in uh, 2013, uh, the world energy outlook of uh, 2014 says that up until uh, 2013, uh, the uh, fossil fuel subsidies were four times that of the subsidies given to renewable energy. So, if you subsidize the conventional uh, energy forms um, and you do not adequately subsidize this, then it is not a level playing field, then the ener renewable energy will uh, never be able to compete. As it is, they have their share of problems. And the fossil fuels are, are not uh, internalizing the, co the environmental and the social cost. Yesterday, I made a mention of uh, internalizing and externalizing of costs. So, if the social and the environmental costs are included in the price of electricity, then the price of fossil based energy would actually increase. So, if the fossil based energy becomes more expensive, then comparatively solar energy would be at par or cheaper. So, all energy firms in my opinion uh, should internalize their costs 
the, the social and environmental costs. And then let us find out which is, which is really cheap. Uh, there is no, no, no reason to artificially reduce the cost by, by subsidizing it or, or externalizing the costs. There is another uh, barrier which I had mentioned that the grid presently is not capable of handling the high variability uh, that is associated with the renewable energy forms and with many, many major breakthroughs have to happen over there. Lot of government spending will be required. I think uh, from what I hear, the present government knows about this problem and they are, they are at it. Uh, we, we have to still see whether it works out or not. Okay, so demand response is uh, whenever there is a demand for electricity, generation should be stepped up or maybe some adjustments need to be made in order to supply that demand. So this shows how there are various power plants over here and there are various load centers over here and the power plants are, some of them are stepped down in their production, some run at low capacity factor, some run at high capacity factor and that, that is dynamically changed in order to meet uh, the needs. This is an example of the daily load curve and uh, this seems to be an urban uh, kind of curve where you see that uh, there is, uh, uh, this is early morning when you probably turn on your water heaters and some lights. So you have some peak over here. During the midday there is a relatively steady uh, load, maybe partly industrial, partly commercial and some minimum household and in the evening there is a huge lighting load. So th this, uh, this may be due to light, uh, lighting. So the grid is supposed to take care of that. Now we, in order to do that, I, I said we need utility scale storage. So we have two videos over here and which, which demonstrate two ways of storing electricity uh, which comes from the variable renewable energy sources. So can we have this video please? Uh, but what we saw over here is that uh, when, whenever the wind is blowing, uh, the, uh, the electricity that is generated, if it is not required right there and then, if there is no demand for it, then it can be used to pump water from a low le level reservoir to a high level reservoir. So that is, so the extra energy uh, generated by the wind gets stored and when uh, the wind is not blowing and you require energy, uh, the same water is let, uh, let out from the high level reservoir through turbines to generate electricity and serve the demand. So this is, this is one concept and it is being used in, uh, it is being planned for Europe and uh, they already have it um, in, in a big way. Okay, the, uh, the, the second way is uh, to, to store it as thermal energy and uh, again as I said the thermal energy will be converted uh, uh, back into electricity on demand so that a solar thermal plant can be operated 24 hours. Whereas uh, for with, with, uh, if you have PV then uh, storing the electricity becomes a major issue. So for on a small scale you can use batteries or some people are even uh, working on super capacitors. But that is all for small scale, not for utility scale. For utility scale uh, this is one, the pump storage is one, one good idea and uh, thermal storage is another good idea. So let's, let's watch this video on solar thermal storage. So this is the issue uh, uh, the related to the problem I said that the base load power has to be uh, provided by some reliable energy source which presently I think only nuclear and uh, coal are, are maybe they, they are up to that point. Geothermal in some places again is, is also uh, reliable for that. So that base load power needs to be provided and then uh, there are peaking plants which uh, operate only some time. So uh, if this technology actually makes it big, then it can even provide base load power uh, through solar. So that is something very exciting. So this, this is what, so if you have uh, the, the same load profiles that I showed you, uh, this is for several days, okay. So this is one day and then the night and then the second day and then the night and so on and so forth. So this is for the month of August. So uh, if, if this is the load profile then you have to have over here you have the different sources of, uh, of energy that are listed. 
So, uh, for hydroelectric also you need some, some amount of water that must continuously flow through. So, that is provided and then there is coal and then there is nuclear and all these various things which are all building up to, to serve that demand. So, the, this, this load profile is served by the various uh, generating um, plants and uh, the, the gas fired and the oil fired uh, plants are very effective in providing that peaking power. Now, uh, we, are, we, are, uh, we are talking about turning off uh, or reducing the, the production of one energy source and uh, increasing the production of another all at the drop of a hat is not so easy. So, that requires um, major reforms in the grid and th there are some technical uh, components also that have to be uh, improved. For example, uh, communications have to be integrated with the power grid that is what is called as a smart grid. Uh, the in general, uh, uh, you should be in a position to shuttle large quantities of power from one state to another. Um, in, in Tamil Nadu, there are some places where uh, th there is a lot of wind power generation, but again that is not all year round, it is not constant all year round. So, when the wind is blowing, uh, that is when th that power is available and it needs to be shuttled to uh, some other state and then uh, borrow, uh, uh, use electricity from that state when uh, there is no production. So, all these features require a smart grid and uh, unless we have that accommodating uh, these highly variable alternate energy forms like solar and wind is not possible. And even if there is a, a smart grid uh, accommodating very large quantities of variable solar and wind power may be a very big challenge uh, to do. So, for now some quantity of um, uh, the conventional forms is required. But since these technologies are, they have a far smaller environmental footprint, they can be encouraged uh, to, to come up to uh, and develop. So, investments and research in these areas uh, should definitely be done so that these farms are not killed in the uh, race. Now, uh, there are uh, many people who are very excited about bioenergy. Uh, bioenergy is, is renewable biomass is renewable. See biomass is a classic example. It, when you harvest it, it, it gets exhausted, but it grows again. So, that is a, an example of uh, a renewable source. So, it is renewable, but uh, the entire uh, biomass that is available cannot be used, because if you, it is part of the biosphere. The biosphere has to, uh, I, I, I think uh, yesterday I gave an example. If there is a mango tree, you can harvest only the mangoes. If you harvest the leaves and the wood also, then you do not have a tree anymore. So, uh, we, we can only use parts of it, some agricultural residue. So, so people say that oh, there is no harm in using agricultural residue, because you have the grain, the food grains that you take, um, that is for food and then what do you do with the straw? Uh, the, the straw is not useful anyway. No, it is not so. It is useful. It is used for, for useful for fodder. It is useful to make manure. Uh, what comes out from the soil must go back into the soil. If it does not go back into the soil, uh, the soil's fertility will decline over a period. So, uh, there is a limit of how much even, even if it is agricultural residue, even if it is forestry waste, there is a limit to how much you can use. And it is not that biomass does not have any, um, any alternative uh, applications. There are alternative applications. I just gave you examples of um, uh, fodder manure, composting, these are alternative uh, uses are there. So, there is, there is only a smaller potential than we normally think. There have, there have been good estimates of how much is the renewable or the, uh, how, how much of this biomass can be used. Um, there, there have been good estimates, how much is the surplus biomass that can be used. In any case, uh, these energy crops uh, being planted on agricultural land is in, uh, in my opinion uh, not acceptable for a country like India, where we have so many people who are um, be below the poverty line and who are facing starvation. Particularly if they are irrigated lands, on irrigated lands uh, energy crop should definitely not be used, because uh, food takes priority over energy. Uh, 
uh, feeding a person is more important than uh, feeding your motor car. So in the, in the, uh, in the selected places where um, there is excess biomass, particularly from your uh, urban uh, so solid waste, uh, that can be converted into fuels. Uh, in fact, in um, many places, including our department in Amruta, uh, we are working on uh, these biofuels. There are uh, interesting technologies. There are uh, the biodiesel is something most people are familiar with, but that requires uh, a, a, an oil yielding plant, and then you uh, convert that oil into diesel. Uh, but there are uh, there are other uh, technologies where you don't require uh, an oil yielding plant. You can just take in about any biomass or even waste plastic for that matter, and using pyrolysis uh, technologies or reformation, you can convert them into um, synthesis gas, which is carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And synthesis gas allows you to, uh, to do some very interesting chemistry. There is something called as the fischer tropsch synthesis, which allows you to synthesize fuels of your choice. So, uh, with, with um, you know, you can make uh, diesel, diesel like uh, fuels, you can make methane, you can make uh, any others also. So, th this allows you to synthesize any liquid or um, gaseous fuel of your choice from starting from synthesis gas. Synthesis gas by itself can also be burnt uh, in um, engines with maybe some minor modifications, but synthesis gas because it has uh, carbon monoxide, there may be a uh, toxicity risk, uh, so that that is one of the uh, big issues with that. Biomass can also be used for hydrogen production, so people, some people are talking about the hydrogen economy. Uh, I am a bit skeptical about the hydrogen economy, I, I do not know, so I think we will have to either consult uh, the astrologer or wait uh, for time to uh, reveal. But uh, the hydrogen, uh, in order to, one of the good ways of making hydrogen is through synthesis gas and followed by a uh, water gas shift uh, to, to make uh, hydrogen. So there are nice uh, technologies, extremely interesting uh, for chemical engineers, even mechanical engineers, uh, many, many nice things to do. And in fact, research should go on in this area uh, because uh, solar and wind is fine, but again there is somebody, I think in one of the... Uh, uh, I think in on Moodle or somewhere, uh, somebody posed a question about the transportation uh, energy requirements. And transportation energy requirements are very high. In fact, in the uh, among the uh, end use sectors, I think it is uh, almost one third of the energy. If I'm, I may be wrong, but uh, something like one third of the energy, or total uh, energy consumption is actually for transportation. And uh, transportation uh, using. Um, hydrocarbon fuels is a, a great idea in terms of energy density. Any of the hydrogen storage uh, technologies or even your battery storage uh, uh, technologies, the energy density that you get is much lower than chemical storage. Chemical storage is the energy is stored in chemical bonds of carbon and hydrogen and possibly oxygen also. There are some oxygenated fuels also. So, uh, the chemical storage is actually a good way and if we want to migrate away from fossil fuels, then uh, bioenergy or biofuels are, are a nice idea. Uh, but again, maybe we do not have as much of biomass energy uh, to, to meet the entire demand. So, some caution is required. If we can develop electric vehicles, um, then that would be great. But if you have to develop electric vehicles, then there has to be a storage technology and electrical storage technology. So the battery technology or a supercapacitor technology has to come up to speed. Or you again store it in chemical energy uh, and convert it to a fuel cell, something like that. Many, many of these approaches are being investigated all over the world. And there have been maybe not major breakthroughs, but maybe small breakthroughs in many, many places. And uh, people who are doing research in this area, it is it's really very interesting. So, um, you can, if you are interested, please go headlong into that research. The country needs such research and uh, the world also needs this research. So, um, plenty of stuff to do in this area. Okay, I have just uh, summarized the, some of the bioenergy technologies. Uh, I think the easiest is direct combustion in the sugarcane industry, for instance, the bagasse surplus biomass is uh, used uh, to partly supplement the boiler fuel. 
so you you can use it for direct combustion in pyrolysis the related technologies there are there are three types of fuels that you can potentially produce uh, one is solid char you can make these fuel briquettes out of the char also you can make liquid fuel it is called as pyrolysis oil but pyrolysis oil may be uh, 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 an adequate substitute for furnace oil but it may not be engine grade so you could uh, pyrolysis oil or wood oil as they call it is not suitable to directly put into your engine you'll damage it um, so may some other um, processes may be required to bring it up to that the uh, third is biomass gasification you can convert it into synthesis gas and uh, this with this syn gas it is possible to uh, synthesize liquid fuels through a fischer tropsch uh, process there is also um, steam reformation biomass can be reformed by um, uh, by um, the application of high temperature steam uh, that is one thing that will give high hydrogen yields uh, but then it becomes uh, endothermic uh, there is biodiesel so that is uh, you you start with some oil which is derived from plants or some plant product some seeds oil seeds and uh, it's transest esterified to become uh, biodiesel there is another very common old technology uh, but uh, it is not to be neglected in any way that is uh, you know, biogas biomethanation there are many other uh, technologies many, there are lots of innovations in this area which will um, improve the yields uh, for instance because i am i am in a although i am a material science engineer actually by training but i work in a chemical engineering department so um, some of uh, my colleagues you know they are discussing about different designs of um, biogas uh, reactors the the reactors the conventional kind that we see uh, in rural places that's that's not the only way or the best way there are uh, better designs chemical engineer specialize in reactor design so if those some of those concepts like a fluidized bed or uh, similar uh, technologies are used for biogas within a much smaller space you can get higher yields in a in a smaller residence time also then there is you know uh, not only methane uh, which is uh, biogas um, but you can also get bioethanol through similar fermentation techniques okay now um, i want to show you this uh, this video and there's a reason why i want to show you this video other than there are there are so many videos and so many uh, so much of reading material on pyrolysis and um, these technologies but i i particularly like this one and the reason i like this one is with this one technology they are they are doing so many interesting things uh, i i want you to make a note of uh, what all they are achieving okay and right after the video i i, I will i will probably ask people you know what are all the things that they are using uh, that that they are doing in this technology um, i'll just give you a hint uh, this uh, the video is shot next to a smoke stack of a power generation plant so they are doing something related to the smoke stack well, smoke stack is nothing but the chimney okay so they are they are doing something with the exhaust coming from a conventional energy generation so i want you to pay attention pay keen attention to that and tell me what are all the various innovative things that they are doing in this so what do you think of it jabalpur engineering college the video which we have watched was uh, fabulous and uh, more we excited that last energy drink yeah so <laughs> we would like to go for that kind of test this is a uh, very uh, uh, means enhancement of the information and this is quite interesting it is going in a nice manner moving ahead very nice sure so uh, can you tell maybe two or three things uh, that you find are very innovative about about that project yes uh, one thing that the, the carbon is actually going into the atmosphere it is polluting the they are capturing once again okay yes so like a filtration and uh, this is uh, at the moment like a magic that one thing which is a wasteful material and we are converting it into back and we are reusing it so it's a by product uh, by the uh, production uh, through this uh, power plant the by product as well we are getting we are using the flue gases 
which are going as a waste into the atmosphere they are doing some useful work for us and uh, this way we this is uh, the enhanced use of the energy awesome so thank is, you very much i suppose that is very well said so uh, you know that that technology is doing many things it is capturing the carbon from the smoke stack so it's a way of carbon carbon capture and it is it is producing these algae which can be dried and stored indefinitely and that's a value added product you could you could select the algae to be edible also the same algae if required can be uh, can be used for hydrogen production then uh, it is also a way of removing the nitrogen oxide so they they actually act as nutrient to the uh, to the algae so the as nitrates you know they they fertilize the algae the growth of the uh, algae also can be sped up a little bit by uh, increasing the concentration so they are not actually uh, using all the smoke stack carbon uh, co2 they are i think they are, they are enriching the to about 1% or so in in air so it's only a small quantity of co2 that they are putting in but that that enhances the photosynthesis it it uh, increases the uh, the biomass output so so many nice things that are that are done in in one system so i think we if we if we get creative and i'm sure that you can if these people were able to find this nice innovative technology with 4000 uh, great minds at work i think we can achieve much more than this okay now uh, i i'm i just want to um, quickly recap what we have learned so far what we have learned so far is that all the major conventional sources of energy have unacceptable environmental and social costs and there is a there is an urgent need for benign alternatives now the benign alternatives exist solar wind geothermal bioenergy these are all present they are abundant we generally have the technology to harness them but there are important barriers and because there are barriers we engineers are in business okay so it's i, I don't think we should look at it negatively i think it is positive it it means that we are required uh there are some technological barriers there are some other kinds of barriers now a sudden transition is impossible sudden transition is not possible and it is it, nobody is recommending that sudden transition but we must have a goal we must have a vision and we must gradually work towards it if we do, if we even uh, if we go into denial and don't even uh, don't even acknowledge uh, uh, the possibility of a uh, of an alternate energy system then there is no hope so i don't think we should uh, take that path i think it is uh, it is important to uh, to to even dream it is important to have a vision and we we'll gradually we have to approach that uh, so some amount of conventional sources will be required to meet the demand but we must be very keen and we must be very sincere about phasing them out in the interest of the environment so i told you that sustainability is is not merely taking a set of available technologies to serve the market demand as if the market demand is something really sacred uh, the the market demand is placed by consumers and we are consumers too so it is it is important for us to learn to live within our means and learn to live within the means of the planet so if we are able to control our need or or modify not necessarily control modify it a, a, a little bit so as to uh, accommodate others other other forms of life and other human beings if we are able to accommodate that then we are on the path of sustainable development otherwise we are we are just dreaming i mean we are we are we are saying something and we are doing something else so sustainability has all these various dimensions now till then uh, until until those uh, that development that r and d in renewable energy form uh, forms happen we need to save energy and energy saved is is as good as energy generated and saving energy it does not does not take any fantastic technology all you need to do is as a consumer you have to be conscious about it at an industrial level many more things have to be done and i i will just point out a few things but what we have to do is we have to look uh, identify the most energy intensive end uses and the efficiency measures if we initially we should implement uh, the uh, efficiency measures in the most energy intensive end uses and later on we can spread them elsewhere Uh, i i'll give you an example making uh, spending 1 million um, uh, dollars to do research to make battery chargers more efficient battery chargers don't consume such a whole uh, huge lot of energy 
to spend 1 million dollars to make them slightly more efficient is not going to positively impact uh, the, the energy uh, scene so much. On the contrary, uh, uh, in making a, a combustion process uh, more, uh, more efficient would probably yield more uh, benefits. So that is what I mean by uh, targeting the um, energy intensive. So we have the industrial sector which consumes roughly 30 percent, residential about 22 and transportation 28 I told you that was very important. Now if we take them sector by sector and see what all efficiency measures we can do, um, the industry which is the largest energy consuming sector um, within the uh, industry, uh, why do they need energy? They need energy to manufacture products that we purchase. So if we purchase products only based upon our need and not merely uh, to, for, to satisfy any uh, whim or fancy of ours, uh, then uh, the, uh, the, the consumption, if the consumption becomes reasonable, then uh, unnecessary production will also uh, not happen and the energy demand may come down a little bit. There is embodied energy. I gave you examples of embodied water. I could, I could have a table with uh, embodied energy also, but I do not have it in, the, in these slides. But I think you have a fertile imagination, so use it. Buying less uh, and uh, buying and wasting less is extremely important. One of the most important uh, uh, measures that we can have. Now, uh, in many industrial processes where heating and cooling is required, particularly in the process industry, uh, solar thermal energy is already quite mature and cost competitive. So that can simply be used. I told you that with uh, an absorption chilling uh, uh, kind of arrangement, solar heat can be easily converted into cooling. So where in processes that require chilled water, for example, milk uh, pasteurization and things like that, you can use solar heat to produce cooling. Solar uh, th uh, absorption based uh, solar air conditioners are also commercial. There are, no, there are not too many companies doing that, but there are companies which are, which are having products uh, for that. Uh, there is another important uh, area which is called as heat integration. If there is one waste heat source which is giving out waste heat at let us say 100 degrees Celsius, it can be used to preheat a feed stream in a process where there are many uh, output streams and there are many input streams. Uh, a, a waste, uh, a, a, any output stream which is hot and which needs to be cooled can merely be connected through a heat exchanger to a cold stream and the cold stream will get warmed up. So this is heat integration, this can be done on an industrial scale in a, in a refinery, you may have so many hot streams and so many cold streams. So in exactly in which is the most efficient combination uh, depending on the temperatures and the flow rate and the heat flux. You can, you can design it and this technology is, uh, is extremely important uh, for the chemical and the process industry. It, it is being done, uh, all the petrochemical uh, giants and the chemical giants, they know about this and they are working at it. Uh, this is something very useful. The, the benefit is that it can give you energy savings uh, which can be very high and with relatively less uh, inf infrastructure cost. The payback periods can be as little as few weeks and sometimes maybe uh, a couple of years, but not considerably more than that. So uh, you can actually reap lots of benefits. Uh, this is uh, combined heat and power, this is cogeneration. This tells you in order to get the same amount of electricity and heating, you can run a power plant and get the electricity and run a separate boiler to generate the heat, but you would be using 147 units of fuel. But if you have a combined heat and power or cogeneration system, you would need only 100 units of fuel to serve the same demand. And in many industrial processes, uh, including our homes also, you require not only electricity, but you also require heating cooling. So in that sense, cogeneration, tri-generation, multi-generation is extremely important and it can give you major benefits. This is again another diagram of uh, CHP. This is a little bit of the internal uh, functioning, how you can um, um, apply that. Out of the box thinking, I had mentioned about that. So this is one example of out of the box thinking. Uh, you can have these um, green buildings which require very less energy to begin with. Uh, I have, uh, you, you saw the Auroville video and in that you saw the, the house by one gentleman. Uh, I actually visited his house 
and it was the month of April in Pondicherry. Now, Pondicherry has weather almost identical to Chennai. It is extremely hot in the month of April. Uh, it, it is really, I mean, the heat is oppressive. And we walked all the way and we were like sweating and all that. And we entered his house. And in his house, uh, I, I distinctly remember there was not even a fan. And it was very comfortable. I was so surprised. So, it was because he had designed the house so beautifully. So, he had some uh, layers of uh, some insulating tiles made from some porous um, uh, tiles. So, he had that and then he, he used, uh, he had a high thermal mass. So, during the night time, uh, you know, he, he would open the doors and windows, allow that to uh, his entire house to cool. And uh, during the daytime, when it heats up, he would close the doors and windows so that the coolness kind of remains inside. So, uh, very nice, but uh, th this is another way by which uh, you can uh, make green buildings and not require so much energy. So, I, I said that there is, we should not treat the increasing energy demand as something sacred. The, the, it is, it is uh, driven by consumers and the consumers can change their ways. If you do not require energy, uh, then, then the energy need not be, uh, uh, be made or, or less energy needs to be produced. So, green roofs are uh, one way by which you can reduce building heat gain. Um, you, can, you can produce some output out of that. There are people who have terrace gardens. Green roofs are different from terrace gardens, but they, 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 are, they are quite similar. You can produce some fruits, vegetables you, using wastewater. So, you, you reduce the building heat gain. You do not require as much of air conditioning or, or fans to be continuously on. You can have a better, more comfortable lifestyle. These two videos are really excellent, but unfortunately, we have run out of time. Um, this talks about completely self-contained eco-houses. So, they are independent in water, they are uh, self-sufficient in water, they are self-sufficient in energy, uh, they use only recycled materials for constructing the house. You know what they are made up of? I mean, who would guess? They are made out of used tires. Used tires are, are uh, basically you fill mud in into uh, these used tires and then there is only a, a, a surface plaster. So, you have these thick walls made out of uh, plaster uh, and um, they, uh, they uh, many other re re uh, recycled materials are, are used for the construction. And uh, there are again, there are plants growing inside. Uh, inside the house, the water is recycled, the grey water recycling similar to what we saw. That is all have, uh, part of it happens indoors, part of it happens outdoors. There is rainwater harvesting, there is a wind turbine, there is a, uh, an energy module which takes from the solar panels and a small wind turbine. It integrates all of that into one kind of uh, energy module and supplies um, uh, that electricity inside. And the interiors are so beautiful, uh, you will uh, really love that. So, finally, it comes down to us, you know, what can we do? And we are, we are all qualified people and in our own field, there are many things we can do. If you are a chemical engineer, I have a list of things that you can do uh, in order to address this problem. Industrial symbiosis, uh, process integration, pinch technology, cogeneration, these are all things which will save enormous quantities of energy, enormous quantities of uh, waste avoidance, waste will be avoided uh, and uh, pyrolysis, gasification, we can uh, make a lot of fuel available, things like that. If you are a mechanical engineer, there are again many things that you can do. Uh, if you are a uh, material scientist, there are, there is photovoltaics, LEDs, nanostructured catalysts. We had uh, a, a kind of a side discussion uh, yesterday about uh, nanotechnology based water purification. Yes, that is required. I, I, I did not say that it is not required. I said that that is we should not stop at that. So, you can definitely contribute to that. There are ultra capacitors, there are batteries and so many other technologies that are there uh, in the overall field of energy. As a consumer, we are all consumers and there are so many things that we can do. Simply minimizing unnecessary purchases uh, is actually the, the easiest and the best thing you can do. Then of course, you know uh, avoiding air conditioners and preferring fans or desert coolers. Uh, people from places like Bombay will say that no, we can't avoid air conditioners because desert coolers will not work in Bombay. 
true they will not work in Bombay, but in combination with a desiccant they will work just fine. Uh, there are there are desiccant uh, based air conditioning uh, technologies where if the air is too humid uh, then it it will not uh, evaporate or I mean water will not evaporate so much so it will not provide cooling. But if you can you can reduce the, the relative humidity of the water by absorbing it in a desiccant uh, and then the air can actually get cooler by a few degrees. And it is only few degrees that we require most uh, most of us Indians we are acclimatized to uh, a hot tropical climate we are born in that and it is it is fun to be in a tropical climate it is not really very interesting uh, to be in a cold climate where you have to think 10 times before stepping out of, of your home and a few minutes out in the cold and you could die. So, uh, it is actually good to be in a tropical climate uh, it is it is ok to sweat once in a while. Uh, so, many many technologies are there uh, that will uh, uh, that will assist us in living in a comfortable manner by uh, with uh, small uh, energy inputs. Uh, CFLs, LEDs you are you are aware of that keeping your computer in shutdown hibernate modes. Um, if you are building a house consider building an eco house there is so much information out there and you can go and visit places where they have it. And uh, I, I, I can tell you uh, there is a 90 plus percent chance that you will fall in love with these eco village, eco houses uh, more than a conventional house. You will like them much better. For short distances using bicycles and uh, public transportation rather than four wheelers uh, instead of air travel um, and um, private cars you know try to use trains or other public transportation and I have a long list you can add to that list. Um, so, that is all from me uh, for now. So, have a nice break.